We're here talking with Monica Araya about the future of transportation. That's a big deal when it's it comes to decarbonizing the world. Yeah, it is. And you know what is fascinating to me, given that I have been in the climate space for, for several years already, is that we have two big stories. One is that there is so much happening and it's amazing how fast it is happening if you think about two or three years ago. And at the same time, we have to go faster and we can't be complacent. So you have to be able to navigate this acceleration that is happening and also look at blind spots and say, oh, but we know we still need to cover more countries or we need to make sure that this is more inclusive. You know, so we, we are living very interesting times. Monica is from Costa Rica. It's one of the most beautiful ecotourism countries in the world. But one thing that may, many people don't know is that in Costa Rica, to make electricity, you're not using any carbon fuel or barely any. Mm -hmm. It's all geothermal or hydroelectric so, or wind or, or, wind or yeah. uh, what's called biomass. Yeah, yeah. That's where it comes from. But you're still not carbon free. How is that? Exactly. Yeah. And I think this is a very important point because that captures the the paradox that we have, which is we already have renewable electricity and we use oil for transportation. So that's a paradox that we, we have clean sources for everything except what we put in our cars and buses yeah. and trucks. At the same time, is a great opportunity right now in 2021 because now we can totally ask the question of why would you use oil for transportation when you can use electricity instead and clean electricity in particular. So one of the most important things is that right now we are at this pivotal moment where we have to start making sure that we open the conversation of when we're going to stop selling petrol and diesel cars or petrol and diesel buses because here's the, the key point about the combination of climate and transport conversations. If we have to be as, an, as a global economy, if we have to get to what we call, you know, net zero or we can call it uh, carbon neutrality by a certain date, and if you think about the fact that a bus or a truck or a car has about 15 years of, of, of you, you know, of life. Life, yeah. Then at some point, we, we're going to have to stop somewhere in order to move to a transportation system that doesn't use gasoline and diesel. And that is no later than 2035, for example, for cars. So one of the things that is really important at this COP here um, is to make sure we normalize the notion that after 2035 in key markets, especially the ones that have a lot of uh, sales of cars, we're going to have to stay well from that year onwards. It's going to have to be uh, transport road transportation that only uses electricity. And that to me is, is, uh, is one of the things that I enjoy doing the most, you know, explaining why we have to do that. So you're going to let the old internal combustion engines kind of grandfather themselves out. Nobody has to, no poor family who only has an internal combustion engine for their car has mm -hmm. to go and get a Tesla <laughs> in, well, in the meantime. Well, so, exactly. Yeah. The, the thing is that um, we have to think systemically. So you, we have to think about the production of the cars, the, the demand of these cars, the policies, what cities are doing, what consumers are doing, because this is the thing we have to get right in the next 10 years. We have to do several things at the same time in several countries that produce these cars. So one of the key signals we have to send to the manufacturers is when are you going to stop producing petrol and diesel cars? Then you have to work with the big, big, big purchase, you know, the big um, fleet owners 
because most of cars are not from people. They are fleets around the world. Oh, really? Fleets of yeah. taxis, fleets for companies, fleets for municipalities, fleets for, say, you know, vans. That's the, the majority of vehicles around the world. Well, I didn't that, know that. That's, yeah. that's where you are going to have to find the biggest. Uh, that's where you're going to find the biggest uh, purchases. You know, for example, if you start trying to accelerate this, you have to look for opportunities for aggregation. So for example, there is now an initiative uh, that brings together 5 million um, units, you know, from big companies, and you say to them, can you please make a commitment to electrify everything before 2030? Yes, we can. Then you go, for example, to a city like Amsterdam, where I live. I'm from Costa Rica, but I live in Amsterdam. Amsterdam has already said, from 2030 onwards, you will not have anything circulating here. That in has an Amsterdam or the Netherlands as a whole? Well, in the Netherlands, it's going to be 2035, but in it's Amsterdam... It's only five more years. In yeah. Amsterdam, it's 2030. Yeah, wow. In twi after 2030, if you want to circulate in Amsterdam, if you are a taxi or a van or a or a motor, if you have a motorbike, you're gonna have to be zero emissions. So my 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 first point is that you, we have to think systemically. So it's not necessarily about Tesla. Tesla is not the point here. The world can have a conversation about buses, trucks, taxis, Ubers, vans. So for example, uh, some people will never have a car. And that's not the point. The point is that you still order from Amazon or you still get food from the supermarket. You're and still contributing so to you, this. So yeah. you have to, we all have to be very good at, at putting on the table the big story. And the big story that we're living through is for the first time we have the technologies that we need to stop using petrol, gasoline and, and diesel and we have to make sure that we tell the story of transformation because when you look at the pace of change in the technologies, we expect by, by 2025, 2026, the price of a, a model that doesn't have a tailpipe, the one that only uses electricity, is going to be about the same price of a current model that is using electric, uh, sorry, gasoline or diesel. So it's very important to help move the conversation about what we need to, what we need to accelerate right now. And one of the things that we have to accelerate is the, the demand, the, 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 sorry, the, one of the things we need to accelerate is the policy signals from governments, from cities, from um, corporates. And what we will see here at COP, for example, is um, the coming together of a coalition that is going to say after 2035, we're not going to produce them. Some car companies are saying already that. One of the uh, paradoxes is how far behind the US is. Europe has a, a nice phase out in the context of the EU. The, the, the European Union has decided to put something called Fit for 55. It's a climate package. This climate package is about reducing emissions in the next 10 years. So for the 27 countries of the EU, the proposal is that after 2035, you don't sell any more petrol and diesel cars. The UK is already um, announced last year. After 2030, they won't sell any petrol and diesel cars. Then you move to Latin America. Chile is not going to sell any more petrol and diesel cars after 2035. California said 2035. New York said 2035. So now one of the big questions is when is the US going to say we as a country are going to only move to sales of zero emission vehicles or electric vehicles? And the great news is that the faster you start shifting, you know, it's like moving from faxes to smartphones. Mm. Why would you want to be with the old technology, yeah. right? So one of the great things is that we can combine this transformation with the need to create new jobs, better jobs, um, jobs that are compatible with the climate economy. And in that sense, um, my, you know, the, the lucky coincidence for me is that I come from a country that produces 
renewable electricity. So in my particular country, our electricity is going to be the source that is going to power these vehicles or buses or trucks as opposed to oil that you have to buy from somewhere, bring it, burn it, and then you have to put it into an internal combustion engine and that internal combustion engine is going to lead to all this exhaust and pollution that we don't really like in the city because it makes us sick, right? Here's the problem with electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. They use electricity mm -hmm. and that electricity sometimes, in some cases most of the time, mm -hmm. comes from either gas fire power mm -hmm. plants or coal fire po yeah. power plants. And renewables are coming online, but yeah. you're still going back to the power source yeah. being fossil fuels. So the great news is that it's still better to electrify than to use and burn uh, fossil fuels. So for example, one of the main messages that we need to get out there is that this decade we have to do two thi many things but we have to do two very well and very fast. One, we have to decarbonize electricity, move from fossil fuels to renewables. We have to do that. And two, we have to use electricity instead of gasoline and diesel. And you don't have to wait until the electricity is clean you already have benefits from switching even if the electricity is not renewable. Just so because the oil isn't being refined into efficient. gasoline? So because, yeah. it, because an electric car is more efficient because it doesn't have tailpipes. So you already save a lot of you know, tailpipe emissions. So the great news is that universities, think tanks, for example, the International Council for Clean Transportation, I, ICCT have plenty of studies uh, that show that even if your electricity is not yet renewable, you still benefit from a starting to electrify transportation. So we don't have, in other words, we don't have to wait until all the electric system is renewable in order to start electrifying. So. Well, let me ask you this. My car is a 2007 uh, internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. Is it more green for me to run that car into the ground and then get an electric vehicle or turn around and get an electric vehicle right now? Look, it's, um, it's a very important point because there are so many myths out there that we need to unpack them. Um, one of the big, the big um, things we have to think about is, you know, do you need a car? And if the answer is no, I don't need a car, I want to walk more and take mass transit, excellent, do that. Yeah. You know, like in Europe. I rode my bike here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so point number one is, is um, we have to ask ourselves, you know, depending on our conditions, where we live, do we need a car in the first place? Yeah. In Europe, for example, in Amsterdam, I don't need a car. I can totally bike, take the, the tram, and I can rent whenever is, and whenever is, is convenient. But people in Los Angeles don't have exactly. that. Exactly. So if you are, for example, in Los Angeles, and you have to have a car, um, right now, if you compare and uh, let's call it a ICE car, internal combustion engine car, the production of that car will have to include how you produce the car plus all the fuels that you use, all the gasoline you burn, and yeah. that creates an impact. And then if you look at an electric car, you will have to consider the environmental impact of producing the electric car plus the electricity that goes into it. The great news for you is that the impact from the electric car compared to the, the impacts associated with the production of a fossil fuel car are very well measured. You know, it's not rocket science. So you can measure it and those measurements are there. So what is very important for people that uh, are out there is that we have to be very good at 
on the one hand, understanding the impacts, understanding <laughs> the impacts, and be very good at not just having opinions without readings. For example, there is a myth. Oh, the batteries are worse for the environment than the gasoline. It's like, who told you that? What where, about did, where did you read that? <laughs> Have you well, read I, didn't, I didn't read that. I didn't no, read no, that. but no, my no. point is, it's very important to debunk a lot of the myths. But there's a lot of lithium and uh, rare earth elements that go into these exactly. batteries as well. And mining yeah. is very present in batteries of computers, yeah. phones. Um, if we are going to move to a renewable energy economy, we will need mining. And that mining will have to be more scrutinized. It's going to have to be more sustainable. And yet, here's the point. If the exam question for the planet is, how do we reduce carbon emissions this decade? Because we have to, by the end of this decade, we have to reduce emission by half, you know, by 50% compared to where they, what they were in 1990. Then we have no choice but to electrify transportation. We really don't have a choice. So the question is, how do we do it in a way that makes sure that the sustainable battery production is there, that is talked about, that is invested in? In Europe, for example, the conversation about battery production is very active. You know, like it's, so for example, in the Nordic countries, they are very actively engaging in how to produce these batteries. In the United States, we do have a problem with our energy grid. We have three different main energy grids. We have got the Eastern, the Western, and the Texas, because they want to be on their own down there. Mm -hmm. But um, these are aging energy grids. Some of them have been around in the same kind of way since Edison. And uh, these things are very old. And in some cases, they break down and they cause forest fires. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's cost billions and billions of dollars to upgrade these things. When you put more vehicles online, mm -hmm. isn't that going to tax the system even more? Yeah, it's very important for the U.S. to learn from what is already happening. You know, for example, in a country like Norway, seven, over 70% of sales of cars are electric. Oh, yeah. Seven Zero, 70 per, over 70%. Nothing has collapsed. It's already happening. A country like um, China, in Shenzhen, for example, there are 17,000 electric buses circulating at the same time. But Shenzhen is the heart yeah. of electronics. Yeah. Right, <laughs> so, so the US needs to get its act together. It's not, it's, it's not about pretending this is rocket science. Others are doing it. Amsterdam, I live in Amsterdam. It's so easy to charge. I can go in Amsterdam, rent an electric car from the street, charged. I can deliver it, rent it with an app. It's easy. It's mm -hmm. happening. So my point, I would argue to the Americans that are not yet fully aware of all the stuff that is happening in the world, is that it is doable to fix your electricity system. It's not, I mean, we just had a panel this morning with uh, New York. You know, New York ban is, is banning petrol and diesel cars by 2035. Yeah. It's already decided. Same thing as California yeah. as well. So, yeah, so they are already having this conversation. How do, the question is, the, the question right now is how to do it in a way that delivers smart charging. What is, you know, what is the investment you need for the grid? What is the investment you need to deploy the chargers? What are, what are the criteria to make sure that it's not just certain neighborhoods, but you, know, you also supply this in, in, in other communities? And what is really interesting is that even within the US, you have a very different conversation if you are talking with somebody in you know in the governor's office of New York or in California than if you talk to you know somebody in a state that is really lagging behind so the good news is that in terms of the technical work that is needed 
Engineers know how to create smart grids. Engineers know how to create, you know, an electricity system that will be able to cope with the increase in the demand. And um, yeah, we're very excited that the U.S. is slowly coming on board, you know, at this COP, for example. What if we skip the batteries all together and go to compressed green produced hydrogen, which pushes through a membrane and creates electricity and water? It's very inefficient. Oh, um, it is? Okay. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's, it's hi green hydrogen mm -hmm. from renewable sources is super important for the economy that we're building. So we're going to need it, for example, for the production of green steel. Um, it's going to be very important uh, when it comes to shipping, for example. And there are very specific applications that are being explored when it comes to heavy trucking. So it's, it, there are applications that are very, very... Um, how do we say this? There are applications where green hydrogen is, is a very good match. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to vans, cars, taxis, buses, right now, it's... Uh, it's, it's all about batteries. It, well, yeah. one of the great news is that people save money when they switch from a bill you know, from the gasoline, st with the gas station to electricity. So if you are, for example, a taxi driver or if you are a company that has vans and you have to do deliveries, once you compare what you spend per month on gasoline <laughs> or diesel and you compare how much you pay on electricity, it makes sense to shift. So one of the accelerators of this will be fleet owners. You know, if you are, for example, a company that has a lot of vans delivering things, and now with COVID, the ac there is a lot of um, a lot of deliveries. Yes, it's 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 there where you find drivers that have maybe not much to do with climate. It's just basic numbers. You know, they economics for them. Or, yeah, yeah. or the other thing that is happening is that um, you you now have uh, you know you now have companies like Hertz. I don't know if you yeah, heard. Yeah, you know, it's just recently within the past couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. So so what yeah. is what is very interesting is that this is this is also beneficial for a person who rents the car because you will you will have to spend less money charging that rented car than if you um, than if you use the traditional. Yeah, it will, it will be people who who rent a car are basically taking that car for a long test drive, too. Yeah. So if you've never been in an electric vehicle, you will go, hey, this isn't too bad, or it might even be better than the car that I have at home. What am I going to think about next time I go to purchase a vehicle? You know, what is very interesting is that we, we have pretty electrified lives. I, you know, when I dry my hair, I l use electricity. Yes. When you film, you use electricity. Yeah. When you power your computer, when you power your phone, you charge your phone. What is very ironic is that we have this thing there sitting in the garage that could be using electricity. And instead, we still have this old-fashioned way of going somewhere to charge it, put the liquid, burning that liquid, that liquid is really literally killing the planet because of the emissions coming from extraction of oil, extraction of gas. So what is fascinating to me is that we are at a point where we are actually looking at a revolution in how we think about mobility. Because first of all, we are going to have to start thinking about cars the way we think about a phone. It's almost like a phone with wheels, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not Everything else needs yeah, charge. It's, it's yeah, it's a charging. Yeah. So, so for example, in Costa Rica, I've been driving electric since 2017, and I've gone to the beach, I've gone to the volcano, I've gone to you know the rainforest. So, it's about finding a plug, yeah. and obviously, if we get fast chargers when we go on trips to say you know to visit somebody to go to the beach. Well, yeah, a fast charger will be nice because you stop, you have lunch, you charge. But on, but let's go back to everyday life. You know, most people in many countries 
don't drive more than 50 kilometers per yeah. day. Yeah. So on a daily basis, forget the trip that you do to Las Vegas or you want to drive to California. Yeah, yeah. For, for everyday life, you know, if you go from A to B, it's usually not more than 50 kilometers a day. So, so in everyday life, it's not that you need to charge every single day. You know, because you, if you if you if you have a, a car that has 300 kilometers and you use 50 today, 50 tomorrow, it's not like every single night you're gonna have to you know be plugged to a fast charger. So what I find really interesting is that there is this moment we're living where you can do this for a car, for a bus, for a truck, for a taxi, for an Uber. And what we really need to do, especially in the U.S., is to overcome a lot of mental barriers that you still see. You know, people, people I find say, oh, I need a car that has 500 kilometers of range. He said, really? You really need one? Or you think you need one? Because what is your week like? Oh, I go to my office and I come back. Okay, so why do you need 500 kilometers in your battery? Oh, you know, it's, so my point is, it's, um, it's, it's a very important time to really engage a consumer. The goal of COP is to get to 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming since the Industrial Revolution and not go anywhere beyond that point, because beyond that point is extremely dangerous in a very fast way. If we don't get off of all oil right now, today, not tomorrow, not next week, but if we don't get off of all oil today, is that possible to get to the 1.5 goal? I mean, it's, it's um, you know, I, I, the way I think about it is, it's like, I don't know if you have taken trains, but you know when you're running late and you say, oh, I... I have eight minutes yeah. <laughs> to get yeah. to that train. Yeah, yeah. If I, if if we hurry up and I'm very good and I run, I will be able to get in the train. Yeah. But if if I'm gonna be get there in 40 minutes, forget it. Yeah, I yeah. am not gonna make it. Yeah. I I find that we are in that in that situation. In that we rush to the train. Yeah, yeah. I, there is a window. We we do have this decade as that, that, that those eight minutes to get to the train. This decade is critical between now and 2030. So that is less than nine years. Yeah. We have to halve emissions. Fif we have to reduce emissions. Cut them in half. Cut them in half. Not completely get off fossil no. fuels, but cut them in half. So there are, there are um, you know, very good examples of things we have to do this decade in order to cut, you know, half emissions by 2030 uh, compared to 1990. And the good news is that when it comes to electricity, we're making progress. You know, we're, we're switching to, to renewables. When it comes to transporta road transportation, we're making progress. Yeah. It gets more complicated with shipping, with aviation, and, and what is very important for, for this window of opportunity that we have is that we get a sense of what makes more sense to do first. So as that's why this electrification with renewables is so important because we can't do everything at once. The good news is that we know what we have to do when it comes to certain sectors and there are others where we're going to have to do in the next years as the technologies get cheaper and get better. I talked to the Maritime Association and they were saying that the batteries are too heavy and there's not enough power to push through storms and huge waves. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at other things to make themselves more efficient, maybe cleaning mm -hmm. the outside of the ship, maybe moving to some sort of hydrogen power. But right now, full electric power, they, they say, is, is not possible. Fine because yeah. we, we don't have to do everything at once. Yeah. And that is something that is very important to convey. Uh, every sector has to do something. Every sector has to reduce emissions. Every sector will have to be more efficient. The point is that while we work on the demand side, so, you know, the demand for fossil fuels for transportation, the demand of fossil fuels for industry, 
we also have to have a more difficult conversation, which is when are we going to stop the extraction of fossil fuels? When are countries and companies going to start saying, I will not drill the Arctic? You know, when are we going to start saying enough? Well, aren't they going to start saying that when it's cheaper not to? Yeah, and I think it's it is it's a combination of economics and politics because I find that some countries are coming to the conclusion that they can start at least open up the conversation. For example, uh, a country like Norway is already having the conversation about their oil dependence. Obviously, the conversation in a place like Norway is going to be very different from a conversation of Nigeria, you know. Um, but it's happening. And, for example, at COP to tomorrow, there will be the launching of something called BOGA, Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. Um, it's, it's led by Denmark and Costa Rica. And the idea is to start going to all countries and saying, where are you going to stop? When is, when is the year that you're going to say, you know, it's not about existing projects. Those existing projects are there. The, the big question is, when are you going to stop new projects? When are you going to stop not Shell, for example? When are you going to stop your exploration somewhere in the Arctic? And I think that is where we need the question you were asking about when you know how much window we have is is very straightforward if you look at all the projects around the world that companies have if all of them go forward then we won't be able to make it we will miss the train what happens to the OPEC countries and the ones in the Middle East and mm -hmm. they rely on oil and that's basically their entire economy. What, what well, happens that, to those That's countries? exactly why, but this is exactly why the UN is necessary because you don't have a mechanism to put pressure on them. What are we going to do? Send the climate army to them? You can't. What are you going to do with Saudi Arabia? Force them? Call them and say you have to stop. That's, that's why. And I, I really want to convey this to people who are in, in watching this. That is precisely why we need to have these very complicated COPs because it's the only way to sit in the same room with Saudi Arabia and a country called Tuvalu or a small island that will disappear. Like the Maldives. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's um, or I mean, think of a place like Central America, not too far from the U.S. Why, why do we think there are so many migrants going to the U.S., mostly kids? Well, if you are in Honduras and there are, there, and you are in a rural area and you don't, you know, you don't have anything to eat because there is a drought caused by extreme weather or there is a, or there are floods because of extreme weather the and you have as well. exactly yeah. in Central America what do we think will happen to all these people well at some point they say well, I'm leaving you know and and the point is that in these spaces where you have oil producers like OPEC countries and you have all these small countries that are being very negatively affected by climate impact you have massive clashes here because what we are seeing is smaller countries telling the bigger countries, your right to grow and to develop fossil fuels is, is killing me. So what's the deal? You know, so, so unfortunately, it's so difficult to bring 200 countries together that it goes slowly. You know, that's why the Paris Agreement took so many years to negotiate. But there is no other way, because how are you, what is the alternative? Who is going to put pressure on these countries? Nobody. Nobody's going to go individually. You have to have this place to negotiate. There are no easy answers here. It's a very complicated situation. The good news is that the Paris Agreement was already signed. And now Saudi Arabia and OPEC countries agreed to it. The, 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 
the concept they agree to is that nobody tells them how to do it or nobody tells them how fast they will go. So just as the U.S. refuses to be told how to do things, the same applies to Brazil or Saudi Arabia or Nigeria. The Paris Agreement basically says every country will decide how much you cut your emissions. You decide. You, Brazil, you decide. Saudi Arabia, you decide. And every five years, you're going to come and you're going to show us your plans and every five years you have to improve them and that's why now that we are at this COP is the first time we have the first cycle of five years because Paris was negotiated in 2015 and what we have seen at this COP is that it's difficult many countries have upgraded their plans but we still need to see more from the bigger ones we, we still need uh, the U.S. to go faster. We still need China to go faster. and India, too. Yeah. Well, Monica, it's been a fascinating <laughs> conversation, and we could go on for hours here. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's really encouraging to hear that we do have some time. We can catch the train. Yeah. We, d we don't have more than like eight minutes, but we, we, we can catch we it just if we get our act together. Got to keep running. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks so I much. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm going to use that. Yeah. <laughs> Keep running. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Monica. You're welcome. Okay.